Hey, what's up? Welcome to the All 49ers show presented by BetUS. That's Jose Sanchez. I'm Grant Cohn. We write for all 49ers, si.com slash NFL slash 49ers. It is March 22nd, 2024, and Brandon Ayuk is still on the 49ers, at least for now. And he hasn't requested a trade, at least not yet. So let's start right there. Jose, do you think Brandon Ayuk will request a trade eventually? the way his friend and teammate Debo Samuel did. Oh, if he does, I hope it's in the middle of a stream. Like we did that two years ago. You remember that stream that happened or why were we about to go live? We're like breaking news. Debo Samuel requested a trade. We're like, Oh, this is going to be fun. So, <laughs> but I think how he's going to, I think for now he's going to stay and stay away from that. I don't think he's going to do that unless it gets to, I feel like the only way he's going to request a trade is if like the preliminary kind of talks they're having now with the 49ers are his senses okay we're really far apart and now let me try to like ruffle some feathers because it's, it's kind of clear what he's doing on social media right now he's kind of just like kind of trolling and messing around so that that's me would probably be if you request one where he just likes to like kick stir the pot a little bit get people talking you know put exterior pressure on the 49ers even though it doesn't really like add to anything but i, I think I, that's something i can see him doing if he's just agitated or becoming impatient but I don't really foresee that being the case. I think he's going to stay away from that and just continue to do little social media nuggets that he's that he said the other day. Yeah. I think if we look back on it, probably Debo Samuel requesting that trade was a mistake. Like, he didn't get anything out of it, and people don't forget that he did it. I think yeah. it, it really cost him more than it gained him anything. So was it a smart move? Was it an impulsive move? I don't know. Seems to me if you want to trade, there are other ways to go about it. Like DeForest Buckner got his way out of town. He said what he wanted. The Niners said what they were willing to give. And I think they essentially said, like, if you can find someone who's willing to give us what we want for you and give you what you want financially, let us know. And he did. So it was all seemed like it was all done behind closed doors. Um, Debo would seem like it was more of, I don't have any leverage. So let me, I don't know, try this. And it didn't work. Ayuk is younger. He watched Debo Samuel sort of fail in his trade request attempt. Maybe he's trying to do something a little bit more clever or a little less. I don't know. But so it seems like just tweeting at Mike Tomlin was pretty clever. Yeah. I think oh, that one was kind of funny. Well, look, they yeah. do kind of look a little bit like twins. A little bit. I'm like, now that I saw, they do actually look like twins. So I, I, when, I, when he did that, I just took that as like face value. Like, oh, this is kind of funny. Like, I don't yeah. think necessarily, I guess it just happens to be that the fact that there was like rumored of interest from the Steelers, which number one, no duh. I'm pretty sure all 31 teams in the league have interest and this happens. It's just the fact that it's the off season that now you all of a sudden hear this and it's like, oh, interest. Look at this. And yeah. then he just turns out to ruffle the feathers because, like, oh, yeah, we're twins. But I, I thought it was funny. Um, but I think he also, like, liked the tweet. I don't know if you saw that. Like, he liked the tweet about someone saying, oh, that's him to the 49ers, like, not answering the call or something like that. So, to me, he's probably, like, um, he's probably just chilling, kicking back, like, let, like you know, stirring the pot. You know, kind of what I like to do on Twitter. Like, send a tweet and, like, send the grenade. Just, like, all right, turn off my phone. Bye. <laughs> I just want to see everyone fight over this. Um, I, I think if he's going to go the trade route, though, it would – I don't think he would do it publicly. Like maybe go the AJ Brown route. Cause when you bring up Debo Samuel, remember um, he's the one that publicly did it and try to be like, you know, kind of like uh ruffle some feathers, pot stir where AJ Brown is like, no one even knew he was going to be on the trade block. It came out of nowhere. Like it's, it's draft date. It's like, wait, what? He's going from Tennessee to the Eagles. So I think if you're going to, if you're going to, if that's going to be the case, he's going to have to do that soon and under the table. And from now it's going to be from now until the draft that you would have him actually be as a feasible option for him to do that. Yeah. Uh, again, going back to Buckner as the template here, it seemed like what Buckner was able to do was say, look, I, you guys want to pay me $18 million a year or whatever. I want 21, 20, 21, and I'm not settling for less and I can get it from other teams who would be willing to trade a first round pick and pay me that money. And he was right. So if Brandon Ayuk wants out, he would have to prove to the 49ers that what he's asking for isn't outrageous because X team, Y team, Z team is willing to pay for it and trade the 49ers a first round pick. Is that the world we're living in? I mean, Jacksonville didn't do it. Pittsburgh hasn't done it yet. These, this is something that could happen on the night of the draft, but I'm not sure if a team would be as eager to trade a first round pick and spend 26, 27, 28 million dollars a year on a wide receiver as they would be trading a first round pick for a defensive tackle who's six foot eight. Those guys are tougher to find. 
Yeah, it sounds like the consensus too from a lot of like analysts, you know, media people, content creators, whatever that you know, wide receiver is in this draft is pretty stacked. Like you can find them. So that's 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 what that's like the drawback of Ayuk here. If he wears Crest to trade, it's like like you're right. It's gonna make him look. It's gonna make you look probably worse. Like in hindsight, if you do extend or whatever, you play out this final year because the odds of you getting traded now are probably very slim. Like if not happening at all. Again, it's gonna happen from now until the draft. But like you said, it's like teams, are they really willing to do that? Like, because yeah. the fact that you have to extend him too, you know, it's a non premium position wide receiver where typically, even when it's not a stacked draft, you could still find some day two or even some day three caliber players. So it, it's really not in the probably best interest either for the 49ers. So, like, you know, even if it was Jacksonville 17, they're only moving seven spots. And, and, and remember back the Buckner trade, like that was during a draft that wasn't that strong at defensive tackle. Yeah. which is why there was a market for him. And the Niners, I mean, like the Colts looked at that draft and said they would rather trade for Buckner than draft Kinlaw. Mm-hmm. And the Niners were like, well, we need to save money, so we'll take that We'll take that risk. But this is a different situation. It's not like, there's a, like you said, there's a bunch of really good wide receivers in this draft. Teams aren't saying, man, you know, need a wide receiver. There's, not, there's no options this year. I'll trade a first-round pick and, and spend on it. Like, that's not the market. Yeah, and if even if you do have that that capital somehow in the top twenty that you get, if you're the 49ers, you really have to weigh like, is it worth sacrificing this all pro receiver who continues to get better every freaking year just to draft potentially your starter at offensive line for the future? Um, a guy who's probably at first will probably be decent, but who knows? You, you know, it's it's a lot of mystery. You know, my, my favorite line in, in this sport is like Family Guy episode where you trade a guarantee for the mystery box. It's like yeah. Brandon Ayuk's Brandon Ayuk all pro. But the mystery draft pick could be anything. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I want to do that. It's true. It could be Tristan Wirfs. It could be Javon Kinlaw. So let, let's go, <laughs> right. Let's go right to that. Should the 49ers trade Brandon Ayuk? I mean, they could give him the money he's asking for, which is a lot. Or they could trade him for another player who's on a rookie deal. And if he's good, they win the trade. What do you think? Uh, it's not in the 49ers' interest, too. And ultimately, I don't think they will. I think actually the route that's going to be taken is let him play out his final year of his deal and then tag him. I, I feel like he's going to follow in the footsteps of T Higgins right now where T Higgins mm-hmm. like on the tag and the Bengals are like, Oh, let's, let's see if we can work a way to either extend him or send him packing. Cause what, what's the thing that's get, keeps getting said about the 49ers like contract situation with the players is after this season, upcoming season, 2024 Debo Samuel's contract becomes way more friendlier in terms of moving him or even cutting him. So for four hours, maybe that's something you consider. It's like, okay, now's the here. We can see if, is, is Debo going to continue this trend? Is Ayuk going to continue this trend? Where now it's like, okay, we can still ride out with them one more year. And then after that, choose between the two or somehow keep them, you know, um, which I don't know how you could because, you know, Brock Purdy is probably going to be due a contract if he does play similar as this past year. But yeah, I, I see that being the viewer. They don't trade them because it's not going to be the offers there. I feel like where no one's going to be desperate. And if you do get like 20, I don't think that's worth jumping just 11 spots that that's serious for a guy who just coming off all pro year. Yeah, uh, you l- let me try to make the argument for why they should trade Brandon Ayuk. Um, a lot of people agree you shouldn't be spending on running backs. That there's there's so many good ones, and they don't. There's just a lot of good ones. There's no reason to spend a lot of money on them. Mm-hmm. You could sort of make the argument with wide receivers too. Every year is a good draft for wide receivers. It seems like the best athletes coming out of high school and college often play wide receiver. And um, the rules really make it easier to play wide receiver. You can't touch them going across the middle. The Chiefs just won a Super Bowl with Marquez Valdez, Scantling, and Rasheed Rice as their wide receivers. Is Brandon Ayuk great? Yeah. But do you need to spend not just 27 on him, but another 24 on Debo and then five on Jawan Jennings? Do you need to have the most expensive wide receiver group in the league when you don't even throw that much? And you don't even invest in pass protection? You might have to sacrifice him to, um, for this upcoming year. It's like, do you really think you can retain him or be worthy? Yeah. So, do you just sacrifice? Like, we just say, screw it and write him, write him this year and let him go or tack. Like, that's because that's where the salary cap con- uh, constraints really makes it like weird. And that's where those restructures, like we talked about last week with Kittle and Hargrave, but it's like, okay, now we're gonna be in a situation where you might be with Armstead again. It's like, hey, you know what, guys? Some cap hits are hitting, and then Brock Purdy's due. You know, what that that's where I feel like you, they have to make the real decision like right now or this offseason to figure that out. Because if they really do believe in Brock Purdy, and again, if he has a similar or, sli- or even a little bit better year than uh, in 2023 and 2024, then now it's like now you really have 
complications of how you're going to move them around the numbers, maneuver it to make your cap even more friendly. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Um, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a good idea. It feels like the kind of thing or they're going to, they're going to extend him. Everyone's going to say they did the right thing. A plus move. And then in two years, it's like, man, you're paying this dude how much money? And he got how many catches? Like not his fault, but I, it seems like the kind of thing that you could sour on really quickly unless he's getting 160, 170 targets. Like, and that's not even that much to expect. If Puka Nakua can get 160 targets, then Ayuk should deserves it too. He is that good. But he's never going to get that many targets on this team. Yeah. Never. Probably the, to feel the case of why you trade him is because I feel like if you trade him, you have to pretty much really be committed to bolstering your offensive line with a more polished prospect, right? Mm -hmm. Move up 10 spots, 15 spots, whatever. Because this is an offense, and I, I felt this after the Super Bowl. I think I said this with you weeks ago, is this offense would benefit by having a more stronger offensive line versus a strong array of skill position players. Right now, their skill position players is high level, elite, you know, all around. Everyone, Anyone would take that group. Where their offensive line is, you know, it's okay, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's not necessarily close to that level. Where if you flip it, you have a strong offensive line versus like an okay skill group that you could probably be okay with that. Like if you just had Debo Samuel, Jennings, and like a, a couple of young guys. I mean, you have Kyle Shanahan who's supposed to be really right. um, creative, you know, smart, right? The genius that we always say. That's the position where he can really that's, – that's where he really earns his money. Like, look, scheme these guys open. Brock Purdy can find them. Some of these guys can beat them guys or develop them. And that's where you can be more shored up. That way Brock Purdy has more time to find these guys. Your running game becomes more efficient. You can do more complex schemes. So – that's something where you could see if you want to trade him, but I think you would have to guarantee yourselves that you're going to go offensive line. Now, I don't know if that team, this team would ever do that because they might go defensive lineman, like you like to say. I mean, you obviously want to be strong everywhere, but you can't spend everywhere. That's mm -hmm. the question. Where are you trying to spend your cap money and where are you trying to save? And it seems to me that you should be saving at the positions that are easy to find talent, right? Like, why spend a lot of money at running back when it's easy to find good ones for cheap? And I think you could use the same logic at wide receiver. It's not easy to find good offensive linemen at all. It's very difficult to find good offensive linemen. So that's to me where I'm spending my money. If I want to get, if I'm trying to find a sure thing and a good player, yeah, I'll pay for the guard. I'll pay for the center. I'll pay for the right tackle where I think that's what the Chiefs have figured out too. You can have a second round rookie uh, rookie at wide receiver, Rasheed Rice, go for a thousand yards. It's, I mean, college is producing these guys all the time. Yeah, I just, it's 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 really like almost like you got to figure out too what's the better investment for Purdy for the 49ers. Like, is it better to keep him long term or is it better just maybe use this pick to that you would receive from him to invest in your offensive line or or just put it elsewhere? Because I think that's ultimately where you're going to think and how much your belief is and you're really going to do that quarterback position. Because like you said, with the Chiefs, since they have a great guy, they don't have to have like these amazing wide receivers. It's, it's like, let's just get an offensive line so all of a sudden our running game is good to make it easier on him. And then we can just work some magic with him in the passing game if need be. So I think I, I, don't, I don't mind that at all where you have like Debo Samuel. On, like you said, positional, they would, that would be two high spent, high priced wide receivers you have. I can't. I can't think of many teams if at all off the top of my head who actually have two like fairly high priced wide receivers on their team. It's usually one and like a slew of other guys. Like it's good to have like one anchor, but not like you have a, have a, like a, like a duo like that. That's a little, that's a little too much. Yeah. Um, back when Debo requested his trade, I remember he was, he wanted more money because he was coming off a phenomenal year what where it? he carried the off. He was the whole team. And I think he felt he needed. He wanted to cash in on that one year, and the Niners sort of used like, "Well, what about the year before? You haven't really." I mean, they kind of used that against him, and ultimately, they won the negotiation. Uh, with Ayuk, he hasn't had that big dominant season. Like, it, he can't say like, "Okay, well, if you trade me, like, what are you going to do without me?" When they extended Debo, he was the offense. They didn't really have a running back other than him. It was him and Elijah Mitchell. And he was the number one receiver as well. So it, it felt almost like a bargain getting him for $24 million a year. Now, if they were to trade, I, you can draft a, a, a wide receiver. They'd still have Debo. They still have McCaffrey. They still have Kittle and Jawan Jennings. Like the offense would still be objectively very good. So it's a move that they could, I mean, they don't have to give him all this money is, is what I'm saying. 
Yeah. Maybe it's the right move, but they don't have to do it. They'd be just fine without him. They have a ton of weapons. They, they have a surplus of weapons, and what they don't have is blockers in the pass game. And I know there was like a case to be made, like why wasn't Ayuk like featured more throughout the playoffs? But it breaks down to like his targets were similar to the season. But I'll basically simplify it as the Super Bowl is like, look, in a time where they need their offense to to gain some big plays, they looked at Debo Samuel more. Like he's running, you got Debo Samuel running fade and post routes. Like that's not his game. Why, why, why? So for Kyle Shanahan, it's clear that in a game where it has to pass, for some reason he looks to Debo. Um, then Brandon Ayuk, because Brandon Ayuk was open on several times and either Purdy didn't see him on purpose or like he just ultimately wasn't the featured thing. My, my thing is like, if you're the coach, you have the iPad in front of you. You could see a dude's getting open multiple times. You literally tell your quarterback, we're going to throw this guy. Like you have to, no, you're going to throw to him. But no, they just kept going with Debo more, Debo more. And it's like, you have the better wide receiver route runner in IU, but why didn't you think about using him more in a featured setup than Debo, who's that's that's not his skill set. You know, I don't blame Debo for those drops and those poor and those poor mismatches where he's getting locked up because look, that's not that's not his game. You're using the, the players for the wrong game. You know what the Niners are? They're a fantasy football team. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's great true, running back. Man. Great tight end, got wide receivers, quarterback. Offensive line isn't part of it, though. Forget about that. It's not even part of the equation. They're a fantasy football team. They really are. They really are. They're like, they got all the guys you want to draft on your Great fantasy seven football on seven team. Great seven on seven team, but Chiefs aren't a particularly good seven on seven team. They're a great 11 on 11 team, though. That's the thing. Really good at that. They keep winning the Super Bowl because they're the best. It's incredible. Okay, let's check out BetUS and see what they got popping today over on the uh, the specials line. Who's going to go 0-17? Who's going to go 17-0? You think the Niners going to go 17-0 next year? I do. No. Can we, can, we, can we bet on it? I want to. Niners, plus 3,500 if they go 17-0 next year. That's good action. That's 350 bucks if I put 10 bucks down on it right now. But look at some of the other guy. I could get, dude, if the Panthers go 17-0, Look at how much money I could get. Do I want to throw away ten dollars? <laughs> I get ten thousand dollars if they go seventeen or no. How do you not bet on that? It's ten dollars. No, how do you bet on this? <laughs> <laughs> how do you not bet on that? What about what about the Raiders at plus seventy thousand? They got some good action there. That's terrible. Come on, ten thousand dollars. Do you know what you could do with that? Shoot. They could look. My gas for the year because gas is hell expensive right now. That's what I'm saying. They they have Bryce Young. He's a, he's a promising young quarterback. Let me talk myself into the worst bet of all time. Uh, who else do they got? They are oh, they recently signed someone. I they got rid of him. Brian Burns. So that's they got rid of Brian Burns. That's good. That helps. <laughs> they got a better head coach now, Dave Canales. What's I'm actually so mean? How about the Steelers at plus fifty thousand? They got Russell Wilson. They were ten and seven last year. They got just like that's not even a joke. That's not even a joke. What about the what about the Steelers? Five thousand dollars for Russell Wilson to, to bring it home. You won't do it. Bet, bet I will. You won't do it. Bet I will. Boom! Oh my god, he's doing <laughs> Steelers to win the Super Bowl. I get five K if they win. That's how much fun it is over at Bet US. Hold on, I got one more thing to Bet say. BetUS, America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. BetUS, where the game begins. I hope you use that insurance. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to win that bet. All right. I want to talk about the defense. It's Nick Sorensen's defense. They're trying to keep things the same, yada, yada, yada. But Brandon Staley is not a wide nine guy. He comes from Vic Fangio tree. He's a 3-4 guy. He's a, um, he's a linebacker coach. And he's good at scheming up pressure, which is something the Niners really don't haven't done very much of the last few years. Um, so let's talk about Leonard Floyd, who was their first signing. And he's Staley's protege, coached him in Chicago, coached him on the Rams. Uh, he's a 3-4 outside linebacker. Kind of an awkward fit in a 4-3 defense. He's a little bit smaller. Um, but there's some benefits. So there's some weaknesses. 
He might be a little bit, you know, soft against the run, setting the edge. But there are things you can do with him that you couldn't do with other th four three DNs, like drop him into coverage. So it seems to me that if the 49ers are going to become more exotic with their pressures, they can do things where they put him in a three point stance. They drop him into a short curl zone and all of a sudden bring pressure off the other side and try to get one-on-one -on -one matchups between a linebacker and a running back. These are things they weren't really doing last year under Steve Wilkes. I don't know if he didn't have the ideas or Nick Bosa didn't let him, but I think like having that kind of a 3-4 uh, outside linebacker on the field is going to give the Niners new options. Yeah. No, that, that's and that's all you want really is variety. Like with Wilkes, their blissing was so vanilla – like yep. forever just going back to that Super Bowl, it's like, you, know, you had Spagnolo's defense like have being so effective with their blitzing. Amazing. That and was the difference in the game like, in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah, the players yeah. were blitzing nearly the same, or you know, not, not, not nothing, nothing too off it, but it wasn't working at all. Like no. ones are just like, just go ahead. Just, that just shoot. Like there was no there's no cuteness, there's no creativity. At least with Floyd, like you you can get that creativity back, right? Um, I think. I, I don't know. I don't honestly, I don't even know if he's going to be in. I think where it gets tricky is like, how are you going to be able to use him as an every down lineman? Is he even going to be an every down lineman? I, I feel like he's not going to be the money. Maybe might be it, But yeah. it, it's just, just cause you're paying them that just don't, does that make sense to actually expose your, your defense that badly? So I wouldn't imagine he would do that unless, you know, teams are like, it's like third and six. And it's like, eh, maybe let's just run it at Floyd. See how he does. I, I'm curious to see how that would be key. How, how offense will attack him and how the 49ers will respond in that way. Because I pretty much fully view him as like a the D four role, just pass press list, just go out there, get like give us like twenty five snaps, and we're good. Let's talk scheme. I mean, usually there's like a, a battle offense versus defense in the league, and it seems like the this last year uh, I was sort of dominated by defenses that brought pressure, but like simulate like not just pressure, but disguised pressure, mm -hmm. four man rushes, but you don't know who's rushing. Uh, guy teams that were able to sort of generate free rushers, all that stuff was paramount this year the ravens did it well the chiefs did it well and the niners didn't do it well they gave up a ton of pressure in the super bowl because they couldn't pick up or decipher these pressure packages immediately after the super bowl they try to hire steve spagnolo who was who drew him up and called him so you can sort of see what the niners are thinking like we want that that beat us uh, the seahawks just got it they hired the baltimore ravens defensive coordinator mike mcdonald as their head coach so Teams that have, I mean, the not, Kyle Shanahan appreciates good defense. It beat him. That's what he wants. And Nick Sorensen can't provide it. It's not his background. He's a DB coach. Bring in Brandon Staley, who does have that background. So I think maybe one thing we're going to see this off this year from this team is Brandon Staley's probably going to be drawing up the pressures. I, I wouldn't think that's going to be Sorensen. Again, he's a DB guy. DBs aren't really involved in pressures like that very much sometimes. So... The Staley effect, go back and watch what he was calling with the Rams and the Chargers, what kind of blitzes he was calling, because that's probably what you're going to see with the Niners. And go back and look what he was doing with Leonard Floyd in 2020. I haven't done it yet. Something to think about. It might, that actually might be a good pairing too, because look, remember, he spent that year, uh, Nick Sorison with the linebackers, and he spent that year with uh, with D'Amico Ryans. So mm -hmm. I think some of that, those linebacker pressures, they'll be able to connect it well with Staley. And as for, as for Shannon, that makes sense. Like he wants that creative defense because he, he, he himself is obviously right. A very good disguiser of his mm -hmm. offense. And let me get that for my defense. I need, I, I, cause it really was just straight vanilla. Like last year, like there wasn't really too much cuties. Like it was kind of easy to tell what they're, what they're covered, what, where everything was going. Not too much, you know, not too, not too much. Ma it wasn't, it wasn't enough, but now you get this and it'll be more efficient. And with a versatile piece, like Floyd, like I imagine who can give you those two dynamics of dropping in or, pass rushing that now it's like what are we going to do you know it's like a pitcher you can't just have like one elite pitch you have to have like multiple that you're very effective with yeah and the, the way i sort of judge the effectiveness of a blitz or whatever you want to call it a pressure scheme is are you able to generate a free rusher yeah what you're trying to do you're trying to sort of trick the offense and get them get someone unblocked and I don't think the Niners did that very much. I feel like Robert Sala was able to do that. He didn't blitz on first and second down very much, but on third down, he was very clever. He would blitz K1 Williams. That he would great. deforce Buckner at, at nose tackle, and which would sort of force the center to slide to his direction, then bring pressure from the other side. Like he's very clever. Uh, nothing against Wilkes, but again, he's a DB coach. 
So I thought the Niners had some of the best coverage they've had in a long time. You could see his impact on all those corners. He well, I still think he made an impact on those corners. You could debate if it was, if it was other guys, but uh, Tavares Ward was great last year. I think he. I think Wilkes deserves some credit for that. But the reason the Niners like those linebacker coaches is because linebackers are involved in a little bit of everything, right? Run defense, pass rush, pressure, coverage. They're in the middle of everything. I'm not sure how much credit Ward would himself would give Wilkes. I actually asked him about that at the Super Bowl, and he said, Laugh, "Oh yeah, yeah I, no, like, right. I was cool, but I knew I knew for myself. Like if I just locked in, like zero credit. I was like, oh okay." But, I think he deserves a little credit for Jair Brown, rookie. I mean, I mean, yeah, you get a little bit, no matter what these players are going to say, you get a little bit. Um, not when you were mentioning blitzing, I started thinking like, yeah, those blitzings from Sala were great with Kayvon Williams and like mm-hmm. Tamika Ryan's again wasn't wasn't a high volume blitzer, but he had effective blitz, blitzes with a uh, Fred Warner. You would occasionally see Dre Greenlaw too. Yeah. Um, and Hufunga was great at that too. What I realized is when I remember you said this like a week or two ago when Hufunga was when they when he was still healthy he was like the main db blitzer of the 49ers i don't think they ever did that with lenore i don't know if because lenore is like a little too a little too skinny or i don't know yeah. but once he went out i don't recall seeing any db blitzing at no. all there wasn't enough like shadowing everything just was like okay it's obviously fred warner is going to line up in the a and b gap he's going to shoot there or they're just gonna it, it felt too predictable you know that's and that was the thing like everything yeah. just felt too predictable and now Very you have guys who can give you these these different these different array arrays of play calling that will make you more effective again because that's ultimately what Shannon Shannon is probably you know he's an offensive guy if he's he's probably watching it and he's like dude I know what to attack against this defense so easily why are you making this so vanilla I think that's yeah. why he also had a hand in it with uh with Wilkes it's like dude what are you calling this and, and I go back to that Minnesota Vikings week where he was pissed off about that cover zero blitz at the end of the half and I'm not sure aside from it being situationally. I think it was more like teed off, like, bro, like of, of all the blitzes, you couldn't even make it more clever. Like you literally showed that it was it was it. And Kirk was like, oh, okay, I just I know where I'm going. Like yeah. you're making the quarterback's decision way easier than it needs to be. Right. And so like those blitzes that like Wilkes would call, I feel like he would call five man rushes with man coverage behind it or six man rushes. I'm talking about more zone blitzing here. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about dropping Leonard Floyd into a zone and then bringing a nickel off the other side and trying to get an unblocked rusher, trying to get the offensive line to slide to Floyd. And that, I mean, I think that's sort of what the kind of stuff they're going to try to do this year. Are they better? Cause remember Sarson does have that Seattle background. So I think yeah. we see like more like that heavy cover three zone again. And you, you kind of get back to the root. I think that's why Shannon pretty much did go with him. And you bring Staley in as, as a possible contingency in case like, you know, things will go wrong. But if anything, it's like, cool, we get like a little dude giving him the ear for a first timer and maybe we somehow build a connection. Because that's ultimately why I think they took those three weeks is I know they were looking at candidates, but I think it was more so how it would work between the two. And they pretty much like, I, f- I feel like those were, that's what the weeks were spent doing, trying to get them two to hash out. I want the plan. I want to know now, can you work together? Yes, this is what it's going to be. I won't hear nothing of it. And maybe it took some time for like maybe Staley and other people like to really like come to come to terms and what that would be. But now, now I'm actually, you got to be fascinated on how this is going to work now. Yeah. Um, I, for people that don't know, like scheme stuff, when I say zone blitz, like that's a four man rush and you drop a lineman and you blitz someone else. Yeah. So you're disguising where the fourth guy comes from, but you're still, you still got seven guys in zone coverage. A lot of times if you rush five and have six in coverage, defensive coordinators aren't going to want to play zone because there's so much space in between all the players. They'll play man. So these are, that's what a zone, uh, blitz is. And I think it's what the Niners, they want to be sound on defense. They don't want to take a player out of coverage to heat up the quarterback and like they want to have seven in zone coverage and you can do that and blitz with a guy like Leonard Floyd. So I don't know. I, it just feels like that's probably what Staley was doing with the Rams four years ago anyway. And that's in his background. And I'm curious to see how he integrates it and what the Niners are doing. Just don't, just don't drop Nick Bosa. That doesn't help. That's dumb. I don't no. do that. <laughs> um, Okay, I got another question for you. Bunch of free agents still out there. No one too attractive, but at this point, I think you're kind of bargain shopping for people who can play like roles. Yeah. And I'm looking at that linebacker spot. I'll give Devondre Campbell credit. You know, he seems to be a good run defender when healthy. A couple years ago, he had a lot of tackles. So, okay. I still don't feel comfortable with him on the field like in the nickel defense on passing downs. Yeah. 
at all. And that's okay. I mean, he's almost 32. Is If he could just hold down like a base linebacker spot and stop the run, gr- great. But I still think the Niners need someone to platoon with him. Like if they're going to platoon Leonard Floyd and Gross Matos, then I think they, think they need to platoon English, uh, Devondre Campbell and someone else. So I'm looking at like a nickel linebacker who can cover. And a nickel linebacker doesn't even necessarily need to be a linebacker. It could be a safety. And I'm thinking of one who was a first round pick a few years ago, more than a few years ago. And he played for the Seahawks. And they give up a lot for him. And he didn't do that well for them. But the Niners wouldn't be giving up really much of anything for him. And they wouldn't be playing him in safety or starting him. Should the Niners sign Jamal Adams as a nickel linebacker? <laughs> no. No, because take away the on-field stuff. The off-field stuff, what it seems like last year, is he's becoming like a distraction with his little back and forth with like people in the media on Twitter. This whole like, look. the, the would love Carol, me. Look, Oh yeah, yeah. He might. He'll probably be a new one, um, dude. They they literally made him an inactive on purpose. Like it feels like he's the Carson Wentz of the defenders, where no one wants to be around this guy. That's what's intriguing to me. The Niners should and, also sign Carson Wentz. <laughs> yeah, that, you'll have like one on offense. Yeah, complete the circle, huh? Complete the complete the structure of the fold. Yeah, but no, I, I think that's also where you can't do it. Like even even if you somehow get, you can guarantee like his performance won't be that bad. I just don't know how you're going to bring someone like uh, someone into that locker room that's being viewed as toxic now. But you want chaos because you're the Joker. No, I feel like he's kind of humble now. I mean, he's Is in he? the backside of his career. He, he's he had may have. Minutes. Yeah, he may. Have, no one wants him. That's that. Yeah, so he's right. He's like playing. He's like talking his way out of the league right now. Give yeah. him a one year contract. Two million dollars, one year, two million dollars, nothing guaranteed, and you could cut him at the end of training camp if it doesn't work out. But bring say, him in and give and give him a look. You know when you you know when you sign him, you sign him like after a week of two or training camp when you not when you're unsure of linebacker, like you're like, oh god, Campbell's a little slower than we thought because that's my biggest gripe okay. with him is like just some like okay. I, I didn't watch like totally every Packers game, but like you know the handful I've seen from those guys like damn, laterally. He's not fast. And that's one thing 49ers defense has always been tremendous about on all levels of their defense is having play speed. He mm-hmm. doesn't really have that. And the fact, or maybe he did, but now he doesn't have it right now. It looks like it. You get you get Adams, probably an uptick in speed. But it, wait, I don't even know how much it up, uptick in linebacking speed. Is he? I just thought of something, bro. Did you see my face? I just had an epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> Why mean, are the Niners in the market for another safety? Maybe they're going to play Hafunga as a nickel linebacker, bro. What? Did you think of that? Maybe they're going to play like one of their safeties that they already have as a nickel linebacker. Bro. Actually, Hafunga as a nickel linebacker, I might not be mad at that. You don't want him playing deep, do you? I just I don't I think they're looking more for like straight coverage safeties. That's why they look that's why they brought in Julian Blackman. Like that right. guy's a pretty nice co- coverage guy. Yeah. Um and but then there's also the wonder when is Hafung even gonna be healthy? You know, and, and same okay, thing with this point. guy, Adams. This guy always has injuries too. Good point. Like okay, so if the nickel linebacker isn't Adams or Hafunga, it ain't anyone else on the team. They gotta draft that guy. And it could be again a DB that they play at linebacker on pl- passing downs. You know who could have done that job uh, when he was younger? Tart. Yeah, they did use him there. Yeah, Remember nickel linebacker. He'd be good in man coverage. He got good size, six foot two. He could have done that. Yeah, they they always did yeah. that. Like that that, mm-hmm. was, that was so cool man, about them having them. Yep. You fluctuate between whose coverage, and they both could do it pretty well. I mean, Ward was a better coverage guy, but Tart was capable, and that that's that's kind of I think what 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 I think the dude. They should hit up Tart. What do you think Tart's doing? He ain't doing nothing. <laughs> Dude, ever since the Niners cut him and he went to the Eagles for that training camp, he's no one ever saw him again. I know. Like, he's never been brought in. Hit him up. Crazy. Just text him. I bet he's I bet he'd be down. Do you want to play nickel linebacker? Come on. Didn't he say like didn't he give like subtle shot like on a local radio station around here about the 49ers or, or something about the Eagles or something That's better? Not good. I don't know. That's probably not what you want. I think Jamal Adams would be cool though, because he's uh, he likes the media. I think me and he we could have a, a show together. <laughs> 
That's what you just want him for him, just so you could bro down with him. Like, what's up, man? Like, what are you doing this Saturday? Like, before the game. Like, let's go kick it. I once um, advocated, I think it was 2020, I said the Niners should trade two first-round picks for Jamal Adams. Thank God they didn't listen to you. Seahawks did, though. Sorry. That was pretty bad. It's all right. The Niners drafted uh, Javon Kinlaw instead. Good point. Another whiff. Can we? Can we? Uh, uh, the day he one. He got and a bunch of money though. Man. We just he got a ton of money from the Jets. Good for him. That's in, that's talk about talk about free agency. It gives you like Chase Young got a ton of money. Oh, like thirteen million guaranteed. Okay, Fully guaranteed. About, so wait, did you read that the 49ers knew he had a neck problem and said, "Okay, we don't care." I think they just knew they just wanted to bring him in for the half year and just said like, mm. yeah, we're probably not bringing him back next year. Thank God they didn't bring what him back. What a waste back. of a third round pick. And the Jets are going to have Kinlaw be a starter. I think that's also me why Kinlaw didn't want to come back is number one, he's getting paid more, obviously. But I, but I bet you like it was like a year, $4 million deal on the table for him, but he's not going to be a starter. And he's like, no, I'm going to go start. Because again, like what? Why did, why did Eric Kendricks most likely bail the 49ers? It's like, well, I'm going to play my natural position, be similar you know, one-year deal, or actually, is it two-year deal? I don't know, but but it makes more sense. You know who his backup is at uh, Kinlaw? Solomon Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Sala collecting former 49ers first-round picks like they're Infinity Stones. <laughs> I'm almost complete. <laughs> Does get McGlinchy at some point. Oh, God. Yeah, they would love to quick cut that guy. Okay, See, here are the like Niners' first-round picks. Under Kyle Shanahan. Alvin Thomas. Ruben Foster. Ruben Foster. Mike McGlinchey. Nick Bosa. I don't you don't get credit for that. My mom doesn't pay attention to this. Would have picked him. I don't get credit for that. Brandon Ayuk. You get credit for sure. Trey Lance. Well, and not only that, Trey Lance and you traded other first round picks. That's what makes it worse. Yeah, Trey Lance, Trey Lance, Trey Lance. Three times. So they got Bosa and Ayuk. Are they going to get another one of those this year? Or are they going to get the the next McGlinchey, the next Solomon Thomas, the next in-law? Which, by the way, how did the 49ers of all the teams who traded their first-round pick, uh, former former quarterbacks from four years ago or three years ago, how did the 49ers got the most value out of theirs than a Mac Jones, than a Justin Fields? You know Zach why? Most untradeable. It's a good question. You know why? Because they didn't play him. <laughs> There's still the mystery of him. The mystery yep. box. There's still exactly. that, that boring thing. Hell but, yeah. but did, like, it was never going to work here. When you're a playoff-ready team, it's like, dude, we can't do the James Wiseman Warriors thing. You just, especially at a premium position. You could do that at wide receiver. Right. You know, maybe linebacker, certain position. But you, you just can't do it at quarterback. I mean, everyone thought the Bears and the Patriots and the Jets were doing the right thing by playing their young guys early and getting them on the field. Turns out they just exposed to the whole league how terrible they are. They all are. And by just maintaining mystery with Trey Lance, the Niners got something. It was actually genius, as this, as David Lombardi would explain. It was the best move. <laughs> That's David. I love David. Zach Wills is untradeable. The, uh -huh. You couldn't even throw in picks with him no. or another team just to get something. That's how bad Nothing. he is. Yeah, you it's got how a bad. Terrible player and a guy with a poor attitude is what it looks like. He he's yeah. talking about toxic players. That kid, that kid definitely looks toxic. Uh huh. He's gonna be uh, golfing with Josh Rosen for the next. <laughs> did you see? Did you see that tweet that's going around? Like the quarterbacks of the last three years that were drafted, the only yeah. one actually capably starting is Trevor Lawrence and Brock Purdy, which yeah. is funny because you have the number one pick and the very last pick of the drafts in between since then, or not since then, but that's. I have a theory. It may not be it may not be true, but this is my theory. I feel like the transfer portal has that makes sense dumbed down college offenses because you constantly have players shuffling in and out from teams year after year. How sophisticated can you really make your offensive scheme? Mm -hmm. It seems like you have to make it as simple as possible because you're always teaching it for the first time to hell of players, not just freshmen. So you get guys coming in the league who just it's like, whoa, I haven't seen anything like this. I'm sorry. I think especially when you have, like, in the case of the all the first-round quarterbacks, non-Trevor Lawrence, no, not even Trevor Lawrence, because Lawrence hasn't been great since he's been drafted, is you don't have – a lot of those guys came from perfect situations, practically. You didn't see them in adverse adversarial uh, situations, seasons. Mm -hmm. 
and the levels of competition they were facing. Like everything went right, which is cool. But like like Caleb Williams, Caleb Williams is intriguing because look, nothing went right at all for USC last year, but he was still pretty sweet coming off a of Heisman year. I mean, that's that's something that's like that you take away from. It's like okay, and, and then and then Trey Lance's case, he only played one season, then he didn't play another season, and it's like a lot a lot of these things are missing. That's why I feel like a little bit of the benefit of the Pac-12 essentially dissolving in a way with SC and UCLA going like to the Big Ten and everything is like they'll get more better competition than they did like fighting each other in the Pac-12 where now it's like it'll be easier to probably weed out who's legit or not. So you think they should draft, they should sign Jamal Adams? Well, okay, I'm glad we agree. Yeah. <laughs> sign Jamal Adams, yeah. Sign yeah. I, I convinced you. You weren't really on board at first, but I got you. Yeah, sign him so when he plays bad, I could just it'll be easy to talk, you know, critique him. It'll be easy. Who's a better quarterback? Josh Dobbs or Trey Lance? Josh Dobbs. Probably. It's that kind of interesting year for Trey Lance. Is he gonna is he gonna play? Trey Lance, yeah. I, I was that's what I was gonna say. Like he's probably never gonna play unless someone goes down. Like what's it's yeah. Is he going to get re-signed after this and then not play again? Is he going to have like the longest career of anyone and never play and just keep getting signed? Give, that could happen. Look, it, it's not a terrible career. You're glorified backup quarterback. You 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 were top five pick, right? You don't have to play. A, million, a lot of a lot of money, and you're going to keep making a couple more millions year after year. That you chop that up as a win for your life. To be honest, major win. <laughs> That's something he could easily he could easily uh, stomach for himself. I like the Josh Dobbs signing. I thought that was a really good backup for Brock Purdy. I really love it the most because remember, like, and we disagreed on like, oh yeah, no, back you were like backup quarterbacks are valued. And I'm like, yeah. you know what? They are, but get them at, at a good value. Don't get them like for those five million, you know, or what yeah. you've been doing as as a team, right? The 49ers. Like I saw that, like they signed him for two, two point five. That's standard. That's good bottom line backup. I'm like, that's beautiful. And you get a yeah. guy who's proven that you can if Br- Purdy goes down for multiple games that you could still sustain yourselves and possibly even win games. It's true. I love that one. Yeah, I, I thought it was good. I thought it was I good. Still, it, it, they're screwed, though. Purdy's out for the season. They might make the playoffs, but... Oh, yeah, they're absolutely screwed. But I, what I like about playing. Dobbs as opposed to Darnold, I think he's better than Darnold, too. And I feel like on the Niners, any quarterback, like one of the best things they need to be able to do is avoid pressure <laughs> because there's going to be a lot. And um, Darnold doesn't avoid pressure particularly well at all, even though you think of him as mobile or whatever. Purdy does. Dobbs does. I think he's a good fit. Yeah. He's yeah. extremely smart. That's another thing. Like he's, just, I mean, was it, what do they call him? They call him Astro Boy or something? Cause Astronaut. Because like, he was an actual, like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's smart. He's smarter than me. <laughs> All right, let's start the weekend early. It's Jose's birthday. It was his birthday yesterday, but really it's his b- birthday all week because you only yeah. turn 29 once. You know what I mean? Next year he's going to be 30, and then it's going to be all downhill from there. So live it up, Don't buddy. say that. That's what everyone's saying. 29. It's a really good time. Really, really enjoy it. Look at that face. And Future Metro Boomin came out with the album just for my birthday. So Go jam it. Dude, that album slaps. Anyone watching knows the album is... Album a slapper because Metro Boomin wants some more, just a little bit. Okay, it's, it's toxic season, Grant. <laughs> I next time you see me, I'll be in Orlando. Oh, it's uh annual owners meetings, so we'll talk to is that next week uh, already? Monday, Monday, Tuesday. Oh, shoot, I'm flying now. That's, that's the cheapest flights I could get. It's so expensive going to Orlando because people love Disney World. One of my homegirls is actually there for uh someone's birthday this week so it's it's definitely popping you're going during spring break too that's why it's a spring break time remember oh this week that's why i sometimes hate traveling for my birthday because whether cause i've been to hawaii you know cabo all these places for my birthday and it's like i gotta find that one week before like the spring break really hits because that's when like everything gets like you know inflated from flights and stays and such so that's what's that's any my recommendations problem. for orlando it's supposed to be like disney central right yeah I'm not I'm a big like Disney, Disney guy. guy. Are you, you a big Disney guy? Like, do you, would you go to Disney World and be like, "Oh my God, it's it's goofy"? Hey, check it out. I've never been. I it's no a big. It's a person wearing a goofy costume. Let me go take picture. It's a lot of walking too. And then, and then, 
the rides are for like three year olds and excuse me, eight year olds. <laughs> I'm hoping that if I ever get a girlfriend again, that she's not a Disney fan and forces me to go. Cause I'm going to end up like came and be like, ah, oh, fine. I got to say if I ever get a girlfriend again. Yeah. Okay. If I ever get one, no one likes me. I think you will. Let's everyone put, keep, put good thoughts out there for Jose and his search for a girlfriend. The right one's out there. I think. I'm just going to start playing video games with Mountain Dew, like Xbox style. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll do it. All right. Well, on that note, thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great weekend. Happy birthday, Jose. Yay. Yay. See you guys. <laughs>